This world is getting further and further away from God's Word, God's will, and God's ways. And that distance is widening every day. What are Christians to do as we live in an increasingly wicked world? Today in my Standing in the Gap series, we'll learn three fundamental truths about how to live in the world, but not be of the world. I've entitled this message, Between the Dead and the Living. Some of you know the name E.M. Bounds. He was a pastor, he was an author, he was an attorney. He lived 1835 to 1913. E.M. Bounds wrote 11 books, and nine of them focused on the subject of prayer. Many people will say, if you want to read a good book on prayer, read E.M. Bounds' book on prayer. They said, which one? Choose any of the nine. But he said this, a very famous quote. He said, what the church needs today is not more or better machinery, not new organizations or more novel methods, but men whom the Holy Spirit can use, men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. So I want to ask you a question. He was using men in the generic sense. God is looking for men, women, boys, girls who are people of prayer, mighty in prayer. Would you say that you're a person of prayer? Would you say that you are a person who is mighty in prayer? Many of us wouldn't say that. We say, you know, when it comes to prayer, I'm not very good at, at prayer. I, I, I come to prayer meeting perhaps, but I never, I never voice anything out loud because I just don't feel confident in my praying. And, and many of us, we go to pray, and, and maybe we pray at night, and we fall asleep uh, praying, you know, and uh, we, we go down our knees and we pray, and we think, well, I'm going I'm to pray for a long time. And we, we shoot all our prayer bullets, and we look at the clock, and two minutes have passed. And, and we just think, man, I'm not... I must not be very mighty in prayer. And God is looking for people who are mighty in prayer, so I guess God isn't looking for me because I'm not very mighty in prayer. Here's the good news. God can enable you and can enable me to be people of prayer, people who are mighty in prayer. Jesus said, my house should be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And we need to learn how to pray. Hey, we started a new series last Sunday called Standing in the Gap. It's our theme for 2023. It comes from Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30, where the Lord says, And I searched for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. Thus I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their way I have brought upon their heads, declares the Lord God. God is looking for people who will stand in the gap. And as we studied last week in Ezekiel 22, there was sin that was just rampant in the nation of Judah. There was corruption complete among the priests, among the prophets, among the princes, and among the people. And God says judgment is coming. But is there someone who will stand in the gap? Hey, our world today is rife with sin, and God is looking today to see if someone will stand in the gap. You know, the Bible talks about in Romans chapter 1 what happens to a person and what happens to a society when they refuse to acknowledge God, when they say no to God, when they don't want to give honor to God, when they don't want to give thanks to God. And three times in Romans 1, we see where God gives them over. And God says, okay, you don't want me? Okay, well, I'm going to give you over to your own devices. And the first thing God gives a society over to is sexual immorality. 
Sexual immorality hit America in a big way in the 1960s with the hippie movement and free love and all that stuff that went on with that. And then if you don't respond because of that debauchery, then God gives them over again in Romans chapter 1. And now it's to not to sexual immorality, but to homosexual immorality and perversion. And women go after women, and men go after men. And Bible says that that is uh, vile and unnatural. And then you find when men don't see fit to acknowledge God any longer, that God gives them over a third time to a depraved mind, a reprobate mind. That is a mind that no longer functions correctly. That's an elevator that doesn't go all the way to the top. That is a worthless mind, uh, an unapproved mind. As one Bible commentator said, a reprobate mind is like an, an abandoned building that's full of rats and roaches and snakes. And the question is, as we live in this wicked world, this world that is uh, becoming more wicked by the day and getting further and further away from God's will, God's word, God's ways, how, how do we live? What are we supposed to do as Christians? What does God want from you and me? Well, number 16 is a great passage of Scripture, a classic passage of Scripture that shows us what we're to do and what we are to understand in order to do what we are to do. Because in number 16, we see the character of God and we see the character of God fallen man. This is what the Scripture says, if you follow along with me. Now, here's the background. God has led His people out of Egypt, and they came through the Red Sea, and they saw the power of God. This is a million to two million people that God chose Moses to lead. It's a tough group to lead, a really tough group, as you're going to see. And uh, they were supposed to go. They went through the Red Sea, they go to Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments, to get the law, and from there they were supposed to go up into the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. But they didn't go. Why? Because when Moses sent out the 12 spies, they came back, 10 of them, with a bad report. Say, oh yeah, the land, it does flow with milk and honey. This is some kind of land. Here are some of the grapes there. The grapes as big as coconuts in the land of promise. But they are giants in the land. And we're just grasshoppers. We became grasshoppers in our sight, and so we were in their sight. They're giants in the land. We can't go there. We need to go back to Egypt. It would be better for us to serve Pharaoh in Egypt than to die in the wilderness. And God was so angry with them. And God says, okay, you don't believe me? You won't trust me? Then for every day you spied out the land, you're going to spend a year wandering in the wilderness. And the book of Numbers speaks about those wilderness wanderings. Well, the wilderness wanderings were not without drama, and there's major drama in Numbers chapter 16. Scripture says this, Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took action. And they rose up before Moses, together with some of the sons of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation chosen in the assembly, men of renown. And they assembled together against Moses and Aaron, and they said to them, you have gone far enough, for all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? And when Moses heard this, he fell on his face. Hey, what are we to do as Christians as we live in a wicked world? I want you to notice three fundamental truths, foundational and fundamental truths that we must know so that we can act in a way that pleases the Lord in these dark days in which we live. Fundamental truth number one, we are to understand the sovereignty of God the sovereignty of God. Now, sovereignty is a big word that just means supreme power or authority. It's kind of explained this way in Psalm 29, verse 10, the Lord sat as king at the flood. 
Yes, the Lord sits as king forever. King of the universe is our God. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6 that the Lord is the blessed and only sovereign, King of kings and Lord of lords. There's only one sovereign, and that is the Lord God. And because God is sovereign, because he's king, he sets things up the way he sees fit. God calls the shots. Jesus said a sparrow doesn't even fall to the ground unless God allows it, unless God okays it. He calls the shots on everything. He is in control of all things. Now, he chose to set things up with perfect wisdom, with perfect knowledge, with perfect understanding. He chose a guy that you wouldn't have chose, that I wouldn't have chose, that we wouldn't have chose. His name was Moses. And he, he came to Moses in Exodus chapter 3 at the burning bush, and he says, Moses, I'm going to lead you to, to lead my people out of Egypt. Lord, who am I that I should do that? And Moses, you know the story, he argues with God, and then finally at the end he says, Lord, I can't do it. Send it by somebody else. And the anger of the Lord burned against Moses, and he said, uh, Moses said, I can't speak. And he said, well, you have a brother, Aaron. Let's get Aaron involved. He can speak. And so Aaron and Moses became the two guys who led the people, and it was God's choice. And it says in Psalm 77, verse 20, you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. So Moses is the leader. Aaron is the priest. And God set up his temple, and the, the tent is called the tent of meeting, you know, the tent of meeting, that was a, a tent that they would roll up. They moved around all the time. They finally built a temple in the Old Testament during the days of Solomon called Solomon's Temple. That was a permanent structure. But in the Old Testament, uh, during the time of Moses, that's when God gave uh, instructions on how to build his house. It was a tent, and it was portable. And in the construction of the, uh, of the tent of meeting... You had the Levites who were in charge of all the uh, taking it down and packing it up and moving it and setting it back up. You had the Levites and the priests. The priests were the ones that did the sacrifices and the offerings, and the Levites were the ones who sang. They were like the choir, and they did the heavy lifting, so to speak, to get everything set. Now, you have a guy in the Bible, Korah. Korah is a Levite. Korah, his father, or his grandfather, is a guy named Kohath. Kohath is also Moses' grandfather and Aaron's grandfather. We have the family tree of Levi. Levi is the, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Levi is a son of Jacob. I'm the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And Levi is one of his sons. And Levi was the tribe that was set aside for the service of the Lord. And in the tribe of Levi, you have this, uh, his, one of his sons, Kohath. And Kohath had sons. And one of his sons was Amram. Amram is the father of Aaron and Moses. And then you have this other guy, son of Kohath. His name was uh, Izhar. And Izhar is the father of Korah. So Korah is cousins with Abraham or with Moses and Aaron. And he is upset. Why? Because the priesthood goes through Aaron and his descendants. And he's just a Levite. A Levite can't be a priest unless you're related uh, through the bloodline to Aaron. Unless you're a descendant of Aaron, you can't be a priest. You can only be uh, a Levite. You can only be a singer in the choir. You can only be a person that tears down the, the tent of meeting and, and has different responsibilities. And so he's upset at that. And he says, I don't like this situation. And so he goes out and he gets 250 uh, leaders of Israel to come up against Aaron and Moses. Hey, join my team because these guys are really uh, leading us astray. 
They haven't taken us into the promised land. They took us from the promised land. Egypt was our promised land where we sat by the pots of meat and had leeks and onions. But, but now what do we have? We just have this manna. I hate this manna. We have manna all the time. It's horrible. And so he leads a revolt against Moses and Aaron. Well, Moses and Aaron didn't elect themselves to be the leaders of the band. God did. God sets things up as he sees fit. And so when Korah did what he did, that was major beyond the pale. That was like, whoa, I can't believe you just did that. And so this is what Moses does. He heard this. He fell on his face. You're going to see that Moses falls on his face a lot. He falls on his face in humility and in prayer. And he spoke to Korah and his company saying, tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy and will bring near to himself even the one whom he will choose, he will bring near to himself. Do this, take censers for yourself, Korah, and all your company, and put fire in them and lay incense upon them in the presence of the Lord tomorrow, and the man whom the Lord chooses shall be the one who is holy. You have gone far enough, you sons of Levi. Then Moses said to Korah, hear now, you sons of Levi, is it not enough for you? that the God of Israel has separated you from the rest of the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to minister to them, and that he has brought you near Korah and all your brothers, sons of Levi, with you? Are you seeking for the priesthood also? Therefore, you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. But as for Aaron, who is he that you crumble grumble against him. Korah is leading a revolt, not against Moses and Aaron. He's leading a revolt against God and God's sovereignty and God's authority and the way God set things up. And Moses is saying, hey, who, who am I? Who, who's, who's Aaron that you grumble against him? You're grumbling against God. Hey, God is sovereign. He's the king. He sets things up as he sees fit. And God gets very angry with the sin of rebellion when you rebel against his authority. And that's what Korah is doing. This is called the rebellion of Korah. You know what's interesting about this guy, Korah? He's given a whole chapter in number 16, and he's talked about one time in the New Testament in the second to the last book of the Bible, the book that deals with false prophets, the book of Jude, and it says they have perished in the rebellion of Korah. Woe to them, Jude 1 11. They have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam, and they've perished in the rebellion of Korah. He is a rebel, and God hates the sin of rebellion. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 15, Verse 23, for a rebellion is as the sin of divination, and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. It's the sin of divination, the sin of witchcraft. That's how bad rebellion is. And the insubordination, that word means in the Hebrew, to push against, di displaying arrogance and presumption. That's what Korah was doing. He was going up against the Lord. So we need to understand in this world in which we live, God is sovereign. God is the king. God calls the shots. God defines morality. God assigns position. God gives five talents to one guy and two talents to another guy and one talent to another guy as he sees fit according to each one's ability. God tells us this is true and this is false. This is right and this is wrong. And we see people today, and they rebel against that. Well, how dare God? Uh, how, how could God possibly say uh, that uh, the Lord Jesus, that he is the way, the truth, and the life? No one comes to the Father but through him. That's far too narrow because that, that keeps out a whole bunch of other people that don't believe in Jesus. And so I don't like that. Well, you may not like it, but you're not the king. He is. And the king says this is the way it's going to be. Korah didn't like the way God set it up. And lots of people today, they don't like the way God set it up. And, and as one theologian said, you know, the ultimate in rebellion against God is this transgender stuff. 
It, it, it's, not, it, it's saying to God, God, you're not going to tell me who I am. I'm going to tell you who I am. And if you don't like it, tough. That's what people are saying to God. God, you define morality and sexuality as a man and woman, one man, one woman for life. Well, I don't like that. So I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. Hey, you can do that. Woe to them. They have gone the way of Cain. The way of Cain is the way of woe. The way of Cain is doing it your way. And I'm going to do it my way. And God says, there is a way, Proverbs 14, 12, that seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. That's going to lead to death. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through him. So if you don't go through him and you don't do what he says to do, then you're on the wrong way and you are the, the way, the truth. You're in a lie and he's the life and you're going to be uh, experiencing death because God calls the shots. Now, Korah could have been grateful because he was a Levite because he was born into the tribe of Levi, and I can be uh, part of the, the special assignment and, and work on the, you know, tearing down the tabernacle and setting it back up and singing in the choir and being, working with the priest. He could have been very grateful, but he wasn't. He was hateful, and he was bitter, and he amassed a coalition of 250 people, leaders, men of renown, to join his rebellion. Hey, understand the sovereignty of God, and when you do understand it, then you yield to it. The conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments, because this applies to every person, for God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. The fear of the Lord, what is that? You understand that God is God, and you understand that you're not God, and you understand that your job is to yield to God and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Second fundamental, foundational truth. We are to understand not only the sovereignty of God, but the wrath of God. Because number 16 is really giving us insight into the wrath of God. Jeremiah 10.10 10 says this, But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King, at his wrath, the earthquakes, and the nations cannot in endure his indignation. His indignation. That word indignation in the Hebrew means to froth at the mouth, to foam at the mouth. You've seen dogs, when they get really uh, wild, they start foaming at the mouth. It's a very uh, a descriptive picture of a word that God has indignation. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, God is a righteous judge and a God who has indignation every day. We don't like to think about the wrath of God, but we need to think about the wrath of God because it's one of the characteristics of God. It's part of who He is. God has uh, uh, indignation towards sin. His eyes are too pure to look upon evil. He can't approve of sin. God hates sin. Now, we need to remember, as we sang just a little bit ago, God is holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. That's what the angels say back and forth. We read that in Isaiah chapter 6 and in Revelation chapter 4. The throne of God. We see the throne of God. We saw it through Isaiah and we see it through John in the book of the Revelation. And the angels, day and night, they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Now, if you had to pick one word that best describes God, now God uh, can't be described with just one word because God is so great, He's so infinite, He's so uh, beyond anything that our minds can comprehend, but if you had to just come up with one word that would best describe Him, it wouldn't be the word love, although God is love. It would be the word holy because that's the word that is repeated in heaven day and night. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. They don't say loving, loving, loving is the Lord of hosts. They don't say merciful, merciful, merciful is the Lord of hosts. They don't say compassionate, compassionate, compassionate is the Lord of hosts. And God is all those things, loving, merciful, compassionate. They don't say omnipotent, omnipotent, omnipotent. That's too hard to say. And so they, they don't say that one. 
but God is omnipotent, right? All powerful God. Holy. God is set apart. He's different from us. He is pure. That's why he told Moses, when Moses wanted to see his face, Lord, show me your glory. You can't see my face, Moses. No one can see my face and live. That's like looking into the face of a billion blazing suns. You would be incinerated by my glory, by my holiness. And so God is holy, 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 and God hates sin. And God is surely going to judge sin. And wrath comes because of sin, because holy God hates sin. He has indignation toward sin. So Moses tells Korah, you guys come down here. And he said, we're not going to come down. You haven't done what you said you were going to do. Moses, you hadn't taken us into the land of promise, into the land flowing with milk and honey. You, you took us from the land flowing with milk and honey. Just twists everything around. And Moses says this, verse 16, you and your company be present before the Lord tomorrow, both you and they along with Aaron. Because see, this is, this is a fight for who is the priest and who sets up the priesthood. Does God or did Aaron and Moses, or does Korah? And if you get enough people, uh, you know, God's not running a democracy. This is a theocracy. God is king. He's the sovereign. You don't, you don't say, well, God, we want to vote on it. And God's like, I don't care what you vote. I'm the king, and this is the way we're doing it. And so here you have this situation where it's like, okay, you guys want to be priests? Well, you guys, you guys all come up, and Aaron will come up, and you're going to take your censer. You say, what's a censer? A censer is this thing that they would use for incense. I have a picture of a censer to give you an idea. And I grew up Catholic, so we had these in Catholic uh, church. And uh, you would put fire in there, a coal of fire in this metal container. It's also called a fire pan. And you put incense on the top, and then it, it would be on a chain so you could, you could swing it around and you would smell incense. And so that was one of the things that the priests would do because inside the tent of meeting, and I have a picture of the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, just to give you an idea of what that thing was like. This is what they hauled around. You had this linen fence around the whole thing, and you had the altar there at the outer court, and then the bronze laver where they would wash. And then inside the tent, you had the holy place and the holy of holies. The holy place would have the table of showbread. It had the the seven-pronged lampstand that was fed by olive oil, so it was always uh, burning in there. And then right before the thick, heavy veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, you had the altar of incense. And the incense, that pictured the prayers of the people. And the priests would go in there, and they would offer up an incense offering in the morning and in the evening, and the people would come to pray, and they're praying inside, uh, uh, outside the temple uh, tabernacle, while the priest is inside offering up the incense, and the incense was a soothing aroma in the nostrils of God. It's a picture of prayer. And so it was for the priest. And so the priest would have this censure be, censor because he would be the guy messing around with the incense. Well, Korah wants to be priest. So Moses said, okay, you come with your entourage, with your 250 pals, and uh, you come before Aaron. And it says, so each of you take his fire pan, verse 17, and put incense on it. And each of you bring his censer before the Lord, 250 fire pans. You and Aaron shall bring his fire pan. So they each took his own censer and put fire on it and laid incense on it and stood at the doorway of the tent of meeting with Moses and Aaron. This is a showdown. This is gunfight at the OK Corral. Who is going to be shown to be holy? Thus Korah assembled all the congregation against them at the doorway of the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among the congregation, that I may consume them instantly. But they fell on their faces again. This is how Moses and Aaron respond to difficulty. They humble themselves and pray. 
They fell on their faces and said, Oh God, thou God of the spirits of all flesh, when one man sins, will you be angry with the entire congregation? Lord, don't, don't destroy the entire congregation. This is Korah and his group. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the congregation, saying, Get back from among the dwellings of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Then Moses arose and went to Dathan and Abiram with the elders of Israel following him. And he spoke to the congregation saying, Depart now from the tents of these wicked men and touch nothing that belongs to them, lest you be swept away in all their sin. So they got back from around the dwellings of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the doorway of the tents along with their wives and their sons and their little ones. And Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these deeds, for this is not my doing. I'm not king. God is king. If these men die the death of all men or if they suffer the fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord brings about an entirely new thing, and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that is theirs, and they descend alive into Sheol, then you will understand that these men have spurned the Lord. They've blasphemed and despised the Lord. Then it came about as he finished speaking all these words that the ground that was under them split open, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up, and their households, and all the men who belonged to Korah with their possessions. So they and all that belonged to them went down alive to Sheol, and the earth closed over them, and they perished from the midst of the assembly. And all Israel who were around them fled at the outcry, for they said, The earth may swallow us up. Fire also came forth from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering the incense." Whoa. I mean, that's a big time whoa. When God opens the earth and swallows you up and closes the earth on top of you, you know, we've, we've all probably seen videos of sinkholes that just come out of nowhere and people sink. But you've never seen a sinkhole uh, take down a house or a road or something like that or a family and then close it back up again. It doesn't work like that. This is from the hand of God, and in case you thought it was just a coincidence, then fire comes out from the presence of the Lord, and the 250 uh, saps that were with Korah, they're all dead. This is serious stuff that's happening. What is God showing here? He's showing his wrath. God gets angry with the sin of rebellion, and God is surely going to judge sin. Now, when you think about the wrath of God, remember this, wrath comes, it's expressed differently or, or in different uh, expressions from the Lord. You know, we talk about the wrath of God. Hell is the wrath of God. That, that's eternal wrath where the Lord says, depart from me. I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness, into the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. That's eternal wrath. But there's not, a, not just eternal wrath, there's there's eschatological wrath. You say, what is that? Well, eschatology is the study of end times. So there's end times wrath. You read about starting Revelation chapter 6 through Revelation chapter 19. It's about the wrath of God. That's what the tribulation period is. God pours out his wrath on a disobedient and obstinate world that rejects him, that goes its own way. And you have uh, seals of wrath, seven seals of wrath, seven trumpets of wrath, seven bowls of wrath. It is awesome, awful. Billions of people die during those seven year, years of tribulation. Jesus said if those days had not been cut short, everybody would have died. That's eschatological wrath. You have sowing and reaping wrath. That's just kind of built into society. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows this, he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh shall from the flesh reap corruption. And so there is wrath from God that comes upon those who participate in sin. It's just kind of built in there. But not only do you have eternal wrath and eschatological wrath and sowing and reaping wrath, you have, you have abandonment wrath, which is in Romans 1, where God gives you over, gives you over to sexual immorality, gives you over to homosexuality, gives you over to a, a reprobate, depraved mind. But then you have this kind of wrath that we just read about, cataclysmic wrath. Wrath, it just, boom, just comes like that. It just comes suddenly. 
That wrath came when it started raining in Noah's day. That was a cataclysm, cataclysmic wrath. The wrath came on Sodom and Gomorrah when God rained down fire and brimstone on those wicked cities. Wrath came to Nadab and Abihu, Leviticus chapter 10, when they burned strange fire before the Lord. They were the sons of Aaron, and they burned strange fire that God hadn't commanded them to burn before the Lord, and boom, they were dead like that. Fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. It's just cataclysmic. Uzzah tried to uh, steady the Ark of the Covenant when it looked like it was going to fall down, and uh, he died instantly before the Lord. You don't touch the Ark of the Covenant. And so God brings cataclysmic wrath, Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament, they lied about a piece of property they, they sold, and they lied to the Lord. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You've not lied to men, but to God, Peter says to them, and they drop dead just like that. Now, that kind of cataclysmic wrath that Korah experienced and all those people with him, that also establishes something. And God uses that kind of wrath to establish his word. It, it, it sets a precedent. We could call it precedential wrath that sets a precedent that, hey, you are, don't cross this line. So Ananias and Sapphira, that was precedential wrath. That's the Lord saying, don't cross this line. Now, does God kill everybody today that lies in church? No. Well, what if he did? Where would you be? Where would I be? Be preaching to an empty house. That's where I'd be. And uh, so <laughs> I'd be gone too. I mean, all of us would be gone. But he's setting a precedent. Don't do this. And this is what it says in verse 40, that the Lord did this as a reminder to the sons of Israel that no layman who is not of the descendants of Aaron should come near to burn incense before the Lord that he might not become like Korah and his company just as the Lord had spoken to him through Moses. This is setting up as an example, don't do this. And this guy is going to get cataclysmic wrath to teach you that. Now, I think we would all say if we had been there that day, we saw the ground open up and close over those guys. We saw fire come out from the presence of the Lord and, and it consumed the 250 that were uh, part of his uh, rebellious group, that we would say, man. I mean, great fear would fall upon the congregation. We would say, man, do not ever rebel against God. I mean, the case would be closed. Nobody else would do that. And yet we read in verse 41, but on the next day, all the congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron saying, you are the ones who have caused the death of the Lord's people. It came about, however, when the congregation had assembled against Moses and Aaron, that they turned toward the tent of meeting, and behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron came to the front of the tent of meeting, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, get away from among this congregation, that I may consume them instantly. It's the same thing he said previously. I'm going to wipe them out. They were coming, as some commentators said, they were coming to kill Moses and Aaron. You caused the death of the Lord's people. Well, number one, they weren't the Lord's people. They were rebels. The Lord, Moses calls them wicked men. They weren't the Lord's people. And Moses and Aaron didn't cause the, the death of them. But Moses and Aaron don't have power to open up the earth and swallow them alive. Moses and Aaron can't send fire down from the presence of the Lord. God did that. Obviously, God did that. But they're blaming Moses and Aaron. Hey, we're to understand the sovereignty of God. We're to understand the wrath of God. And thirdly, we're to understand the power of intercessory prayer. Because Moses and Aaron intercede for the people. Now, you mark this down. A rebellious spirit is contagious and deadly. Korah had a rebellious spirit, and he spread it around. It's contagious. It's deadly. How did he get 250 of the leaders of Israel to join his group? He went to them. 
privately to tell them how they were getting a raw deal, to tell them how Moses and Aaron were, Aaron were hijacking the whole assembly of Israel. Hey, they, they're, they're saying that they're the only ones, that uh, you have to be Aaron's son to be able to be a priest. Well, we're all holy. We don't need to listen to them. Who are they to, to set themselves up? Uh, Ab Moses thinks he's the priest and, or, or the prince and, and Aaron the priest. We're all holy. And people listen and they said, okay. Hey, that happens in churches a lot where you get some malcontent, some rebellious person. And what do they do? They go and, and maybe they're real slick at talking to people. Maybe they're really, really smart. Cora was probably a smart guy in some sense, but he's, he's devious. What do you see in heaven before God created man? You see Lucifer, the number one angel who was a malcontent, who was an ingrate, who said this isn't right, that, that all this worship is going to God. It should be coming to me. And he was able to take a third of the angels with him in rebellion toward God and rebellion against God. It's amazing. Hey, Rebellion is a contagious and deadly sin. You need to steer clear of rebellious people. What do we say? Hey, kids, listen, students, listen to this. Watch out for the rebel at school. The eye that mocks a father and scorns a mother, the ravens of the valley will pick it out and the young eagles will eat it. Somebody who is rebellious toward mom and dad. Somebody who dishonors mom and dad. Somebody who's always getting in trouble. You don't want to hang out with that person. Why? Because bad company corrupts good morals. And, and this rebellious person is putting himself, herself, on, on a collision course with destruction. Don't, don't hang out with them. A rebellious spirit, contagious and deadly. And listen, here's the... The thing for pastors, uh, Moses is such a great example because Moses took it on the chin a lot. And you know, when God would get mad at the people, he would tell Moses, your people have done this, Moses. Your people have done that. Moses is like, my people, and not my people. But Moses would intercede for the people. Why is he always falling on his face? Because he's interceding for the people. When God says, I'm going to destroy the whole congregation, oh God, don't destroy the whole congregation. On account of Korah, he wouldn't do that. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? You wouldn't do that, God. And he intercedes for the people. But now they come to destroy and kill Moses and Aaron. And it says in verse 42, it came about, however, when the congregation had assembled against Moses and Aaron, that they turned toward the tent of meeting. And behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron came to the front of the tent of meeting, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Get away from among this congregation, that I may consume them instantly. Then they fell on their faces. And Moses said to Aaron, Take your censer and put it in the fire from the altar and lay incense on it. Then bring it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them, for wrath has gone forth from the Lord. The plague has begun. Then Aaron took it as Moses had spoken and ran into the midst of the assembly, for behold, the plague had begun among the people. So he put on the incense and made atonement for the people, and he took his stand between the dead and the living so that the plague was checked. But those who died by the plague were 14,700 besides those who died on account of Korah. In one 24-hour period, you had almost 15,000 people that died. Why did they die? Because they rebelled against the sovereignty of God. And when you rebel against the sovereignty of God, then judgment comes from God. Anger and wrath come from God. And the only remedy is repentance and confession and faith. God is a good God. God doesn't want to judge. God wants people to come his way. The Bible says, uh, speaking, the Lord is speaking, all day long I've stretched out my hand to a disobedient and obstinate people, and they won't come my way. And so, you know, God has, his patience is marvelously long. He's slow to anger. That literally means long in the nose. It takes God a long time to get angry, but God's 
Uh, patience is not limitless. You can provoke him to anger, and when you mess around in certain areas, bam, it comes. Cataclysmic wrath comes. You grab on to the, the Ark of the Covenant when you're not supposed to touch that, you will die. You look into the ark as they did, the men of Beth Shemesh, they looked into the ark when the Philistines sent it back, 1 Samuel chapter 6. What did they do? They died. You didn't do that. You treat God. God is holy, 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 and he is the king. And so Moses sends Aaron, and he says, get fire from the altar, because that's the only place you could get the fire from, Nadab and Abihu burned strange fire. They didn't get it from the altar. And so get fire from the altar, put it in your censer, put it in your fire pan, put incense on it. And one commentator said they, he probably got the incense from the, the uh, holy place where they had special incense there that would be on the altar of incense and it would go up before that thick, heavy veil and, and take your incense and run out in the congregation and take your stand between the dead and the living and burn the incense, and the incense as it went up, a picture of prayer. It's a picture, Aaron is, of a person standing in the gap of making a difference. And people are dying that day like this, 14,700. You talk about sudden adult death syndrome. Uh, that was it uh, because a plague went out from the Lord. And Moses told him, you got to hurry. And so he hurried. And see, number 16, it's an attack on God, obviously, but also an attack on Aaron's priesthood. And what does Moses do? Moses shows that Aaron is the priest. Aaron is the one that has the censer. Aaron is the one who burns incense. Aaron is the one who's the priest, who stands in the gap. Not because Aaron's so great, it's because God chose him to do that. Hey, wrath. You may not like to think that God is a wrathful God. And you, you, so many people, they want God to be what they want him to be. Mark it down. God is not who you want him to be. He is who he is. You don't mold God into your image. What does he say to Moses? I am who I am. And God is a good God. The Lord, the Lord, God, compassionate and gracious abounding in loving kindness and truth, slow to anger, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will not leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. God is not going to have fellowship with sin. And you want to know how you can know that you know that you know that you know that God will not have fellowship with sin? It's when his own son was dying on the cross, taking the sin of the whole world, and he cried out and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's because God cannot, God will not have fellowship with sin. God will not overlook sin. And if there was ever a time that God wanted to overlook sin, it was when that sin was on his own dear son, the Lord Jesus, but he didn't. He couldn't because God is holy, holy, holy. And Jesus died for the sin of the world. As the song said, he could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone on Calvary for you. He took the wrath. You know, we talk about standing in the gap. God says, I searched for a man among them who would stand in the gap for the land that I would not destroy it. And in a real sense, there is no one who can stand in the gap except God himself in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, wrath is coming to this earth, and it is coming because God is holy, holy, holy. And the only reason it hasn't come yet is because God is patient. But one day, as Adrian Rogers says, that the, the waters of God's wrath are furiously beating against the dam of his mercy, and one day that dam is going to break, and God's wrath is going to come. But here's the good news. You don't have to experience any wrath because Jesus took all your wrath, and you can stand in him, and you can be forgiven 
and you can be set free. I'll close with this story. This is a story that Harry Ironsides told years ago. It, it was a group of people traveling across the country in the early days, and they had their covered wagons, and they were going across. They had crossed a stream, and they were about a day uh, across this stream, and they were out in this huge field with dry grass, and all of a sudden, they saw smoke coming their way. There was a huge forest fire that was coming their way and burning up the grass before them, and it was coming at them so quickly, and they were there with their wagons and with their families and with their children, and, and uh, everybody was panicking. What can we do? This is moving too quickly. We can't outrun on this. And one man said, I know what to do. And he lit a match. And behind them, he lit the grass on fire. And someone said, what have you done? Now we have fire coming at us this way, and we have fire behind us. He said, I know what I'm doing. And the fire began to burn behind them, and the wind was blowing up behind them. He said, now, back up and stand in the burn place because the fire cannot come where the fire has already been. The fire fell on the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary. He took all your punishment, all your guilt, all your shame, all your hell as he died upon the cross. And if you put your faith and trust in him, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and of death. Listen, Jesus is our Savior. He's our King. He's a God you can get close to. He's a God who loves you. He's a God who is patient with you. And he's a God who calls you and me to come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and do what Moses did and do what Aaron did and intercede for the people and to be a person who prays and a person who walks with God and a person who stands in the gap between the dead and the living because judgment is coming. And unless you're standing on the solid ground of the Lord Jesus and his blood, you'll be swept away. Thanks for watching today. As we close out the program, listen, if you're not certain about your relationship with Jesus, today is the day to make certain. Just pray this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I believe that you are God in the flesh who died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. Forgive me of all my sins. Be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my all to you, and I promise to follow you all the days of my life. If you'll pray that prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in, and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please contact me and let me know about that decision. Hey, until next time, make it a great week, and may God richly bless you.